Without further ado, then, let me introduce to you Father Virgilio Elizondo of our theology department, well known to many of us for his writing and speaking over many years, and he will introduce our keynote speaker, Virgil. Thank you, Mike. It's a great privilege, it's un gran privilegio, dar la bienvenida a todos, to welcome all of you to Notre Dame for this very, very exciting conference that's been planned for two years. And I've been a very fortunate person to be a part of the, of the committee that's been organizing this. He, they asked me today to introduce our Archbishop of San Antonio, my boss, so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> but I thought I would, he said, you're right. <laughs> But I thought I'd introduce him in a little different way than most introductions. I'm going to tell you about the great sin of the Archbishop. <laughs> you know, you don't hear that most often. But the Archbishop, after he came to San Antonio, everybody fell in love with him right away. He said, enamorados de él inmediatamente por su abrazo, su cariño, su carisma y todo esto. He revealed to us the great sin of his life. He said, I love to eat. <laughs> Me encanta comer. <laughs> and you know, I thought how, how beautiful it is for tonight. Because Jesus loved to eat with his friends. You know, he loved to eat with publicans and sinners and important people, rich people and, and poor people. And in the context of that enjoying eating with people, he proclaimed the good news. And then, my dear friends, is our Archbishop. Archbishop, who's my boss, and I love him deeply, and everybody in San Antonio does, es un hombre que de veramente goza de estar con el pueblo, de escuchar, de dar el brazo, de dar la bienvenida, de estar con el pueblo. He always has time for people. So in his very life, in his very life, he preaches what is worth proclaim. So without any more, because I could say a lot more about him, but we were so fortunate in San Antonio to have such a beautiful, marvelous person who just loves people and his very life proclaims what he preaches on Sundays or otherwise. Archbishop Gustavo García Sierra, Archbispo, un honor, un placer, bienvenido. Well, let's uh, begin our time together this evening, which is uh, the whole motivation of tonight is that will help us all to dispose ourselves to deepen uh, the beautiful gift that it is to convey the Word of God and to talk about it and to bring people to an encounter with Jesus Christ, who is the Word. So let's uh, just begin calling upon the Holy Spirit. And I invite you just to repeat uh, three, four times. Then, Holy Spirit, then. 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 I would like to begin with, uh, with a quote from... Uh, John of the Cross, that says, Una pal palabra habló el Padre, que fue su Hijo, y esta habla siempre en el eterno silencio, y en silencio ha de ser oída en el alma. One word, the Father spoke. And that was his son. And this word speaks always in the eternal silence. And in silence should be heard by the soul. With this quote, what I convey is that we are going to be talking much these days, and learning much in many ways, and exchanging 
our experiences and our understanding of preaching. But it's so important to know that is in the deep silence of the people when people encounter the word that is eternal. And to leave always room for that particular encounter is important in the midst of all our facilitation and expression of the word. I would like to thank and congratulate the University of Notre Dame for organizing such an important and excellent conference for the life of the church. Qué gran alegría estar en la universidad de Nuestra Señora, la estrella matutina de toda la evangelización, para meditar sobre la grandeza de la predicación del verbo hecho carne que habita entre nosotros. Dios con nosotros, God with us. And nothing is more basic and more important than our preaching. It was the preaching of the apostles that gave rise to the church from the very beginning. And it was a response to the mandate of Christ. And it is our preaching that continues to illuminate the minds, motivate the hearts, and encourage the lives of Christians. So preaching invites people to conversion and nourishes their lives in such a way that the word of St. Paul becomes true. But how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone to preach? And how can people preach if they are not sent? It's a whole process here. Moreover, St. Francis told us, St. Francis of Assisi, we are sent to preach the good news of salvation at all times, if necessary, by using words. And this is very important in the life of the person who gives a homily, who preaches. Our lives of, of Christian charity give credibility to our words. And that makes a big difference. And even I'm sure that you have heard when people, they say to you, thank you for the words. Thank you for, the, for your thought. And in some times... Oh, I must say, all the time, if there is good work, is not just the words. It is the life that accompanies the words. So, um, la integridad del predicador es clave. The integrity of the preacher is a stake. Otherwise, there will be new methods, new ways, new imagery, you know, and, and all of us, we, we know our talents and we know what, what we are good. And if we utilize it, that's great. But the integrity of us is a stake. And this uh, integrity is the work of love. And that is what we are trying to achieve. Yeah. The love of God and the people they will know about it and experience themselves loved. Unfortunately, one of the frequent complaints we hear from Catholics is about the poor quality of our preaching. People tell us that sermons are boring, superficial, irrelevant, and useless. Well, not about us. I mean, about the preaching, right? <laughs> not about us. Yeah. Uh, our people are hungry for good, good preaching that will illuminate and encourage their lives to console them, will challenge them and motivate them. And some, they prefer evangelical churches where they encounter 
a dynamic preaching. Many of those who have drifted away from the Catholic Church in the last 20 years have said that they did so because their spiritual needs were not being met. And this is important. Not necessarily the way the preaching was in sounding or in the great, you know, technology, which is very much needed. You know, one of my most frustrating experiences has been when I go to a parish and the PA system is, is not working properly. And I'm sure that you have experienced that. But visiting, you know, I have had uh, the experience now to visit almost 140 parishes of the Archdiocese, and, and really in those parishes, the date is not even those external things. Uh, and I'm sure that you, you are going to pick up on that uh, along the way these days. Very easy things for preaching. But the main thing is how our integrity as followers of Jesus Christ will come across. Otherwise, it was a great sermon. And what? Though it's true that uh, many of our people have been leaving for many reasons, but particularly because of our preaching. So la palabra de Dios es vida, y así como la lluvia suavemente cae sobre la tierra para producir fruto delicioso, así nuestra predicación debe llegar a nuestros pueblos para producir en ellos, en sus corazones, la nueva vida del amor de Dios. Amar el camino regio del amor. After all, giving thanks to God in our celebrations, every Christian could be an echo to the words of the scripture that say, your words are spirit and life, tu palabra nos da vida. Your words are spirit and life, tu palabra nos da vida. I'm sure that that is an echo in the hearts of the people. And it's an echo in our own hearts, in our own lives. We have the truth, yes, but we need to beg the Holy Spirit to fill us with the same Spirit that moved Peter on the first Pentecost to preach with such fervor, piety in the positive sense, conviction, and enthusiasm that people thought that he was, had too much wine to drink. We too need to be gently inspired and emboldened by the Holy Spirit so that our fear, fearless conviction and exuberant joy will not only bring people to Christ, but likewise set them on fire so that they can be instruments themselves. You know, our work in preaching doesn't end with the ones who are listening to us, but our hope is that those who listen to us in turn fire up by the Holy Spirit, not by you and by me, they will in turn go out and do precisely when we say the Mass is ended, go in peace, go forward, go forth. We preach God's love, and we preach Christ crucified. We preach the word of mercy and forgiveness, and we preach the word of freedom and love. So we preach the world of a new life, a truly life in Him, and the fullness of this life. And we do not dare to fail. Because to start preaching, knowing that it will not work, that is first mistake. It will work by the power of the Holy Spirit and your readiness to cooperate with the Spirit, for us to cooperate with the Spirit. So um, it's important to know that we don't go on our own about preaching. We are moved 
and send. And that was the, the pedagogy of, of, of the Lord and the first apostles. And the key here is that we don't preach about ourselves. I mean, to use examples, and I mean, it's very genuine. And we need, again, based on that integrity, to share ourselves is a great thing. But it's not about us. And that's a great danger. And very, very much is a temptation to make the whole situation about us. And we have the history uh, and, the, and the lives of so many saints, women and men, that they have in their journey of faith discovered the, the little tricks about and temptations of making the whole thing about us and not about the Lord, the Word incarnate. And that's why that piece about silence. If people, they don't come eventually to the silence in which they, they connect deep inside. It's, it's a great production and, and does good, but not necessarily will move to holiness. Our preaching should be not, nothing less than a conversation of love that inflames people so completely with the love of God that they cannot wait to become lovers of God. And, and, and love in that profound sense that Benedict XVI, our Pope, has been conveying in, in, in his uh, many opportunities and especially in his writings. It's very clear. It's, it's, it's the quality of love, the love of God. But there is, it's the experience of a di loving dialogue. And so how to engage people in different ways that they end in ending being lovers of Christ and lovers of humanity and lovers of the work of God, the mission. The Second Vatican Council pointed out, prayer should accompany the reading of sacred scripture so that dialogue takes place between God and man. So how, through our preaching, that there will be dialogue because of the questions that we pose, because of the examples that we use, I don't know, you know, the way we convey it, and our life, our integrity of life. I'm sure that every one of you has been call, called by Christ. And you are living accordingly. You have a lot to say, a lot to give, a lot to share. So that the dialogue will be real in people's lives. And it's true that the dialogue imp imp implies thinking. But above all, loving. Dios es amor y solamente con el entusiasmo de un amante, de alguien que ama, que da su vida, podremos comunicar las grandezas del amor de Dios. Más que pensar, which is included, es amar. In his apostolic exhortation on the Word of God, Paul Benedict has pointed out that the preacher should be the first to hear the Word of God that he proclaims, or that that person proclaims. The person should be the first. And we know, you know, and we, we celebrate Masses every day and, and some many Masses a day or liturgies. How difficult that is. How difficult that is. And I think something that we have arrived to in general is to prepare our homilies for the weekend, for Sunday, which is a key moment in the life of the community. But every time, you know, I remember my, uh, the founder of my community, Félix de Jesus Rouget, a French priest. He taught us how to read the scriptures for the following day, besides we prepare them and how much we were able to 
time spent on that, was to end the day reading. In some way, letting the Word of God just stay with us during the night. And it has been a great help to me. It is true. Because otherwise, it will be barren, our preaching. St. Augustine says, He is undoubtedly barren who preaches outwardly the word of God without hearing it inwardly. Without hearing it. So um, the Holy Father adds that the faithful should be able to perceive clearly that the preacher has a compelling desire to present Christ, to present him. And that could be, you know, our prayer always before preaching, that I will introduce you, Lord, that I will present you to the people now in a different way and, and with the help of your spirit. For this reason, preachers need to be in close and constant contact with the sacred text. They should prepare for the homily by meditation and prayer so as to preach with conviction and passion. So your words are spirit and life. Tu palabra nos da vida. In the first Pentecost, each one of the listeners from throughout the world heard the message on their own tongue. This is a tremendous challenge for us, considering the fact of the growing cultural and linguistic diversity of our communities in the United States and in the growing number of our parishes. So it's a combination. We have a, a, a different ethnic groups with different languages and cultures, but also that we are growing in communities, in the number of communities, so that multiplies the ministry, which is a great opportunity, but it's, it's not easy. So it's not just a matter of preaching in a different language, which is already a challenge, but even more so being aware of the cultural particularities of our parishioners. And I will say, being, I am born Mexican and uh, Hispanic, and I will say now it's, more, it's very common to hear the Hispanic population and the new challenges with the Hispanic communities, Spanish-speaking or English-speaking or bilingual-speaking. Yes, we don't have to, to waste time. But we missed many opportunities many years ago in which we were saying, English only. We mutilize people. We cut the trend of the interior life and that silence in which the world wanted to take flesh in many ways because of the principle of incarnation. But now we have the Vietnamese, you know, we have in general the Asians, the Africans, and even we have in leadership, thanks be to God, many people from many different countries helping us in the preaching. We were stubborn. We were wrong, and we need to accept that. So the growth of the people has not been there, and we want to take them to a place where they haven't traveled. This is a great challenge. To adapt ourselves and to connect so the dialogue will take place. As we present Christ, the Savior of the world, who goes beyond cultures, languages. But because of the incarnation works through culture and language. That's a, that's a great thing. And... Uh, well, we need to recognize that we are in these times and we will do all what we can. And even more with the help of one another by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need to become keenly aware of the cultural expressions of sin and grace that are present within the ethnic groups that we serve. Because it's a different way for them to come to accept their sinfulness and to accept 
the opportunity of God's grace. Using examples from their everyday life, bringing the scripture to life in ways that are captivating and easily understood. Furthermore, the lesson of Pentecost must remain clear in our hearts that the Holy Spirit lives in the hearts of the members of our church. So not only the Holy Spirit will work in you, in me, but the Holy Spirit is also working in them. And that is very important. We cannot say they are going to be saved only through me. It's the Lord who says, and the Spirit of the Lord is at work also in the people who are listening to us. And, 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 and to, to contemplate that will help us to facilitate the dialogue. The presence of the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit are at work in the preacher. But the Holy Spirit is also at work in the listeners. There is a lady in the, in the cathedral. It's a poor lady. But prays so much. And is so present in, to the community. That that lady is doing a tremendous work of evangelization and connecting people to the church beyond what I do that is limited to sometimes being there in the cathedral and sometimes visiting with people. I'm not sure if she finished uh, the basic schooling, but what a catalyzer of God's love. So our preaching must honor and reverence the presence of the Holy Spirit within those to whom we preach. Now, because of the teaching of our Lord and promptings of the Spirit in our lives and the lives of others, we have to be very specially concerned about our brothers and sisters who live in the culture of poverty and this destitution, which is growing even more, and we know it, because of our economic crisis and many other factors. There are many brothers and sisters who live in poverty, in, in destitution, homeless, children and teenagers who have never had a home, those who live in the streets and under the bridges, the permanently under, under, underemployed, and the many other marginal peoples of our society. We need to be concerned not only about what we are called to do, but where people are at in their own lives. To be concerned about them, not, not only about our success or our, our preaching, but about them, and, and, and that God is calling them to something. With great love and compassion, we need to reach out to those who live in fear, now that is the new picture of our, our communities, fear. Many people live in fear. For instance, could be the undocumented brothers and sisters, or those who have experienced violence in so many ways. La gente vive el miedo. How we're going to help them to keep the dialogue going for our preaching. It is very true that we have only one gospel to preach, but it will take on very different language and emphasis depending on who is listening. So we preach differently to faithful who live in a financial security, but might be taken in by the allure of self-reliance than when we preach to the very poor who know what is to trust in God, but often have a hard time seeing hope. So it's different settings, different realities. But we must preach the glad tidings to the poor. While challenging the wealthy to obtain the true riches that come from self-donation and trust in God's will, for wealth will not endure. So cada cultura es un mundo. Y así como el verbo se hizo carne y habitó entre nosotros, Así nuestra predicación tendrá vida 
y será eficaz en cuanto utilice palabras, ejemplos, imágenes, metáforas comunes al pueblo. Tenemos que estar especialmente conscientes de los pobres, de los indocumentados, de los que viven en, en situaciones de miedo y de violencia, siendo objetos de injusticia. So the effective proclamation of the word of God needs to consider the new challenge that all, all of us we have. And we some, some of us we have been preaching for a long time and sharing the word of God. But now the new challenge is in the mode, style, and invitation of the new evangelization. That was called by Blessed John Paul II and Pope Leonard XVI. As you know, the new evangelization will be the focus of the world synod of bishops this October. Again, as the Holy Father has pointed out, nations once rich in faith and in vocations are losing their identity and their influence of the secularist culture. So the counterpoint here is not just our preaching, because our preaching could be very adequate. But again, with the first point regarding integrity, if our integrity or coherence in life as followers of Christ is not conveyed, the new evangelization will not take place. It's just more information. It may be very good information. The new evangelization is taking us into the mission. In the increasing secularism and consumerism of our society, so many people are losing their way to true happiness, not recognizing that God alone can satisfy the deepest hungers of the human heart. And I'm sure some of you or many of you are in, in prison ministry. So they are more limited to some experiences of worship that we have regularly in the parish. But great conversions take place right there. And a, gr a great new fire of love is enkindled in people in that confinement. In other words, God does not grow tired to elevate humanity and to keep in a deeper level that dialogue going. It's how we will understand people, people who dedicate their lives to, to different kind of ministries uh, and even lifestyles that could be the monks. Sure, God is working in people's hearts and lives. So your words are spirit and life. Tu palabra nos da vida. Preaching the word of God is a sacred privilege, but also an awesome responsibility which turns to us into a duty. It's our duty. It should not be kind of a choice on this. It is true that we have permanent deacons. In some way, we need to enter with those who help us in preaching the word of God in, in our liturgies or in other celebrations. We need to be in the same mind. And to know that is a duty. When I look at my own unworthiness and my human frailty, I have to ask myself how God could ever call me to be mediator of his word. I often feel like the prophet Jeremiah who felt overpowered by God's call. But consoled and encouraged by St. Paul's words that he has pleased God to choose the foolish the lowly and the ones who count for nothing in the eyes of this world. Let us recall just the Blessed Mother. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior because he has looked at his lowly servant. Here I am, the handmaid of the Lord. Be done unto me according to thy word, thy word. So, uh, 
through the mystery of Christ, through the every detail of his, of his life, from his conception to his ascension, we come to know not only the truth of God, but equally the truth of our own humanity. And when people, they can connect with that. When people, they know that we are speaking the truth and trying to articulate it. But they know that as serious the Lord is for us. Speaking about his love. He's speaking about our love and his desire that we be transformed. The Second Vatican Council taught that it's only in the mystery of the incarnate word that our own mystery, the mystery of what it truly means to be human, is revealed and made clear. So only in Christ do we find the deepest meaning of our life, our activity, and even our death. For it is only in and through Christ that the deepest desires of the human heart will be clarified, purified, and fulfilled. In Gadium Spes, number 42. So the hearts of the faithful are filled with so many difficult tensions that you and I, we have to, Maybe in a different tent, but it's no different. You, know, you have heard expressions that they said, well, you know, uh, the priest or you priest or you bishops, you are not on our shoes. Well, it could be for different reasons, but we need to connect to the point that we are on this together. And the word of God is for them and is for us. And we are for one another. And our preaching will convey just what is needed for the true dialogue between God and the person. And then the person with the world will take place. As Pope Benedict says, by recalling in these ways the mysteries of redemption, the church opens up to the faithful the riches of the saving actions and the merits of her Lord and makes them present to all times, allowing the faithful to enter into contact with them and to be filled with the grace of salvation. So that is. So a, as I expressed earlier, is the Holy Spirit working in you, the Holy Spirit working in them, and to facilitate to what we are going to learn these days, even more about to articulate the word of God so that can touch people's lives and hearts. Solamente en Cristo podemos satisfacer los deseos más profundos de nuestro corazón y llegar a la plenitud de nuestra humanidad. Él es el camino, Él es la verdad, Él es la vida. No podemos solucionar todos los problemas de la gente, pero ciertamente podemos acompañarles en su búsqueda con palabras que les den dirección y esperanza. Dar la palabra, dar Dios. To give the word, to give God. To give God. In 1 Peter 4, 11 says, Whoever preaches, let it be with the words of God. That can help us to make an examination of conscience. In the way we preach, this is more the funny part. It is more the serious part. It is uh, the, the heavy contact. Yeah, we need to analyze it. But to be sure that whatever... Whoever preaches, let it be with the words of God. So preaching is not so much a lesson in a scriptural exegesis as it is an attempt to interpret our human situation through the scriptures, to bring out the divine meaning of our human situation. 
as the U.S. bishops have written the homilies, a scriptural interpretation of human existence which enables a community to recognize God's active presence, to respond to that presence in faith through liturgical word and gesture, and beyond the liturgical assembly through a life lived in conformity with the gospel. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, bishops. <laughs> Nuestra predicación es una interpretación del verdadero significado de nuestras vidas a la luz de la palabra de Dios. La palabra de Dios es vida y da vida. The word of God is life and gives life. Nos permite reconocer la presencia de Dios entre nosotros y responder a su invitación como sus amigos íntimos. This last phrase, that is the Gospel of John, and we have uh, Father Juan Alfaro who will be also sharing with you. But his specialty is in the Gospel of John. This time he's going to share about the Gospel of Mark. But uh, in the Gospel of John, it's very clearly the whole point is to end being friends of, friends of God. And how you and I, through preaching, we are going to make friends of God. No, my friends, no, our friends. Of the, the feeling good and all that stuff that could be part of it. But the bottom line is that they will end being, through all this dialogue in the different directions, friends of God, friends of Jesus, amigos íntimos de Jesús. So good preaching easily draws people into the mysteries of God's love. And thank you for all the good preaching that you have done. Thank you. I'm sure that people have said thanks many times, but in, in this I take the opportunity to thank you for your preaching. Preaching is not primary about abstract knowledge, dogmatic pronouncements, or moralistic imperatives, which in our time, that is the temptation for some because of the situations that we are going through and we will continue facing. Authentic Christian preaching begins by reflecting on the various images presented in the scriptures so as to invite the believers and unbelievers alike into the mystery of God's intimate, infinite, merciful, and tender love. Revealed from the beginning of creation, but especially evident in the mystery of the cross. I pray to Our Lady of Guadalupe, patroness of all America, and star of the first and new evangelization, to guide our deliverance, or the, uh, our deliberations these days filled with the Holy Spirit so that we will be faithful and effective messengers of God's infinite love for one another, the one and only force that will convert enemies into friends, strangers into family, hunger into abundance, enslavement into freedom, and war-torn cities into peaceful neighborhoods as well as misery into well-being and tears into laughter and the cries of pain into songs of joy. Christ, Christ, Christ. He is the firstborn of the new humanity, of the new heaven and the new earth. And through our preaching, we are called to give birth to children of the new creation and nourish their lives until we reach the ultimate fulfillment in heaven. Llenos del Espíritu Santo y con la compañía de María, Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, estrella de la evangelización en América, tomemos ánimo 
y expresémoslo en la alegría de proclamar la nueva vida del amor de Dios. I would like to conclude saying, following the footsteps of our master, let us fear no one and be filled with the freedom of the Spirit. Be enthusiastic. And it's not about personalities. Let me tell you that. I know people that they are very quiet, are enthusiastic about their faith about their Lord, about people. Be creative, be bold, be courageous. For like the faithful at Pentecost, we are to be on fire with the spirit of God's love, the only force that can save the world from destruction by transforming it into a new civilization of justice, love, and compassion. Your words are spirit and life. Tu palabra nos da vida. I finish with a quote of the beginning. Una palabra habló el Padre que fue su hijo. Y esta palabra habla siempre en el eterno silencio. Y en silencio ha de ser oída por el alma. One word the Father spoke. It was his son. And this word speaks always in the eternal silence. And it is in silence that this word is heard by the soul.